So um, next up, we have another remote talk. I promise they won't all be uh, batched up like this. Um, and this is uh, a gentleman named Tarun Chitra from uh, Gauntlet Networks. Well, not yet, it's not. OK, um, here we go. And the title of the talk is Competitive Equilibria Between Staking and On-Chain Lending. And many of you might have already heard of some of the discussions around this paper as it, it kind of uh, lit up uh, the Twitter sphere. And there was a, a few Medium uh, articles written about it as well. Um, this is kind of the uh, DeFi cannibalizing the security of uh, uh, non-thermodynamic systems. So uh, Tarun, can you hear us? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? We can. Um, could you be a bit louder? Yes. Uh, yes. Perfect. Sure. perfect. Is this better? Okay. okay. Let, let's roll right. to Rune. Thank you very much. Awesome. Um, can you guys see uh, the this, this slides? Uh, we can, but it's not full screen. Yes. That's there. perfect. Great. Perfect. Great. Awesome. So, uh, yeah, today I'm going to talk about sort of competitive equilibria uh, within staking. And staking, you know, I think has been um, sort of promised as a alternative to proof of work that provides, you know, some in some abstract sense comparable security. Um, but, you know, I think the security model has focused on the cryptography side of things. But on, from a financial perspective, they're quite different. And uh, we're going to go through a vignette of one particular way in which they're distinct um, via the relationship between staking and lending. Um, so basically, we're going to go through a few things. So we're, you know, kind of going to go through a high-level example. We're going to go through a thought experiment, a Gedanken. We're going to talk about how to make an agent-based model that sort of is the simplest non-trivial version of this. We'll then go through some assumptions. Um, we'll go through some formal results and then simulation results and kind of uh, conclude. So a bit of an overview. So basically, proof of stake uh, claims to kind of have a, a similar uh, model to, to proof of work. Um, and that is, uh, in general, I would say not a, uh, is, is not totally obvious. Uh, in some sense, staking has this notion of the return on staking always has to kind of dominate the return on, uh, on any other activity you could do. And in the last uh, couple of years, on-chain lending has really kind of grown dramatically. Uh, it was around $10 billion in total uh, lent supply to recently over a billion. And the interesting thing is uh, rational agents, not strictly honest agents, will rebalance their portfolio between, um, between staking and lending. And so the question is, will there ever be a, a scenario in which they rotate their portfolio fully out of staking? So let's let's do a thought experiment. So suppose that we have a proof of stake asset, uh, which also has an on-chain lending contract. The contract allows the user to borrow and lend uh, at algorithmically determined interest rates. And let's assume that fifty percent of the users are rational and profit optimizing. Think hedge funds, crypto funds. Don't think someone running a note at home. So what happens if the interest rate that the lending contract offers is greater than block rate? Well, rational agents would move their staking coins from being staked to lent. Um, but how would this actually happen? You know, why why would they why would the the lending rate go higher than the staking rate? Well, if if say the asset isn't the dominant asset and there's another numeraire, so dollars or Bitcoin, and demand to short this asset uh, goes up then borrowing demand will increase and the interest rate for lending will go up. And it's very likely that it will go higher than the staking rate because the staking rate is actually meant to be relatively low volatility compared to lending rates, which need to adjust to market conditions faster. So, well, you know, you might say, hey, could this really happen? Why, why, you know, why should it, why is it sort of obvious that this is a, a, a vector? Well, let's, let's think about this a little bit. One thing is on-chain lending means that the lending contract cannot stop lending. So as long as people can post enough collateral and have kind of meet the requirements, uh, you're kind of in, in, you know, you can't really get around this. Um, another question that, you know, people often bring up regarding this is, well, wouldn't the fees just go up to correct this? Wouldn't the fee market naturally automatically just jump? Um, and, you know, there's this very famous paper by uh, Arvind Narayanan and, uh, others at Princeton, 
that kind of shows that the strategy space, even for a simple uh, transaction fee model, is quite complicated. And it's not obvious that there will be a unique fee market dominant strategy incentive compatible type of behavior. Um, you know, the next thing that people often say is exchanges and validators won't let this happen. Uh, I actually think that's not quite true yet because exchanges and validators are not really doing sophisticated on-chain analytics, especially at the contract level. And, you know, do rational lenders or rebalancers actually exist? Uh, you know, as, you know, kind of basically the BZX attacks kind of showed that that, that wasn't true, these flash loan type things. And in some sense, you can really think of these attacks as just a bank run, a traditional, boring old bank run, just modernized in the way that it happens on chain. So why doesn't this happen in proof of work? So, so I think it's important to understand this because it gives you a good centering of what, what the distinction in the threat model is between proof of stake and proof of work. So in proof of work, the security really comes from this notion of minor extractable value which you can think of as coming from kind of these, these papers by Hasu and, and Diane. And it really boils down to two things, the hash power committed to the next block and the economics of the block rewards and fees. Uh, in the block rewards case, it's a subsidy and the fee, it's a case of demand-driven um, fee payment. Now, these components are not interoperable in proof of work because you can't convert hash power to the proof of work asset in kind. You can't, you can't just take hash power and convert to Bitcoin instantly you actually have to go do the work and you're not guaranteed the return. There's a huge variance. The other thing is that you basically need an exogenous asset to directly convert hash power to the proof of work asset. But in proof of stake, that's just not true because the asset securing the network is the same as the asset that is used to transfer. So you can convert security by removing the staked asset into uh, sort of you know, some other form. So you can basically move security in and out quite quickly. And this is by design because proof of stake was really introduced in this Bitcoin talk post, as far as you know, the provenance that I know of, where it was introduced as the limit of proof of work where one can continuously reinvest a uh, block rewards into virtual hash power. So every time I get a block reward, instead of having to sell the block, go buy an ASIC, go run the ASIC, I could just reinvest it in the system by, by adding it to my stake. So in some sense, you can't really trustlessly lend in POW unless there was a liquid hash power during this market, which as we've seen, BitDeer and stuff are kind of second tier compared to you know, like normal futures or derivatives products. So, all right, let's think about how to model this. Well, in every presentation I give, including the one I gave uh, at the first MIT conference, I have this quote from Matt Levine, uh, which is basically people in cryptocurrencies more or less keep learning the lessons of finance uh, in the past over and over and over. So in some sense, we really need to figure out how to ensure certain macroeconomic outcomes that we want. Uh, in this case, no bank runs or a reduced probability of bank runs, reduced default probability. Uh, but we need to kind of model it in kind of the simplest possible way to at least get some, some intuition, to, to get some types of uh, formal results. So how do we model this? So, the thought experiment we did kind of shows you something that gives you an analogy to normal finance, which is that rational actors really view their, their staking coins as part of a portfolio that is earning yield. So it's an asset that, you know, if it's not doing anything, is losing money. And if rational actors are expected yield optimizers, then we can start thinking about their portfolio as being either staked or lent. Now, in reality, there's many other yield seeking opportunities. There are staking derivatives. There's locking it in a CDP, uh, like the last talk showed, et cetera. So let's try to make an agent-based model. Well, each agent has some wealth split into stake and, staking and lending. Each of them also has an interest rate. And there's an ensemble of agents with different risk preferences. So the idea is if you're a risky agent, you see the interest rate spike and you immediately move all your assets. If you're a very risk-averse agent, you, very, you see the interest rate uh, outside of staking increase and you just take a long time to basically uh, reallocate your portfolio. So how do people do this in, in traditional finance? Um, so the most common method, uh, you know, if you go to any large quant fund, so like, you know, you go to BD Shaw, Two Sigma, Renaissance, whatever, like everyone will be using at some level, some notion of a Markowitz method. The reason is these are very simple and interpretable. They're sort of easy to construct because you get an optimization problem that's very straightforward. And there's 
$5 trillion of assets they've used them. So it's kind of a, a no one got fired for using a markerless method type thing. Now, these things also have very simple inputs. Uh, and they're basically two inputs. One is the alphas, which is sort of the expected relative return of these assets. And the other is a covariance. Uh, and basically, we construct a very simple, strongly convex optimization problem, assuming uh, positive definite, strictly positive definite covariance. Uh, and basically, these rational staking agents are those who optimize their uh, individual beliefs based on the risk preferences, which are represented by the covariance. And we basically have this ensemble of them optimizing and kind of giving a, a total, total staked quantity and lent quantity. So what about on-chain lending? So on-chain lending, uh, you know, we modeled this after uh, Compound, which is the uh, sort of second biggest on-chain lending platform. If you think of Maker as on-chain lending, which it is in a way, because you're going to leverage long on your Ethereum. Uh, and you know, there's sort of at a very high level, the way it works is lenders lock in some tokens uh, into a pool that they can earn interest on. It actually mints a synthetic token that you that is a lien on perpetual interest. Borrowers ask a contract for a loan and they send collateral. So these are over collateralized loans. These are not like a home loan. This is like a home equity loan where I borrow 75% of my home's value, right? So in this case, I have $150 of Ethereum. I might be able to borrow $100 with staple point against it. Now lenders re receive interest on in every block and the default risk is spread over the whole pool. So if there's 100 lenders and one borrower and the borrower defaults, then the 100 lenders split up the loss parata based on the amount they lend. So what, uh, how, how do we determine interest rates? Well, uh, in this world, people use, uh, crypto people also kind of sort of reinvented something uh, that's existed in algorithmic game theory for a long time called a market scoring rule, but they, in, in, in this world, they call it a, a bonding curve, but it's basically a function that tells you how to mint an interest rate as a function of some macro quantities. In this case, uh, borrowing demand, which is the total tokens desired and the lent uh, supply, which is how many people, the amount of supply available. And Compound uses uh, this quadratic bonding curve. And I should note that the, the original white paper and the actual code are different. So, uh, and, and they just announced a governance token where you can actually just vote on making a new model. So make it whatever you want, I guess. So now we have to think about how to model proof of stake, right? Proof of stake is actually a very traditional stochastic process. It's, it's uh, you know, in some sense, it's the simplest of processes. It's, I, it looks like a Dirichlet process. It's something that takes a probability distribution, it samples from that distribution, and then it mutates that distribution based on the observed sample. Now, in machine learning, this is quite common. Like the Dirichlet process has this happen all the time. Anything that has sort of these factorizable distributions have this happen. And so we don't actually have to model too much state if, you know, to, to get a minimum model here. The main variables we need are sort of the block reward, which we fix in this deterministic, and the validator stake distribution each time. And as you can see, we basically sample some block producers, we sample a Bernoulli variable to decide if they're slashed, and then we update kind of the uh, update the state distribution. So, what assumptions have we uh, have we made here? Okay, so first of all, let's talk about why one needs to make assumptions. Modeling complex stochastic processes always involves making simplifying assumptions. And these assumptions really correspond to making a minimum viable model. And the model will be simpler than real protocols. So that we, we don't have unbonding times, we don't have staking derivatives, we don't have delegation, and we don't have locked rewards. But with these assumptions, we actually get formal results. So, you know, we get very traditional probability results. We get dube style inequalities. So these are tail bound. We get phase transitions between these kind of different regimes, kind of akin to kind of the, the empirical stuff that Naran and et cetera had. Um, and then we also kind of can, can, can really look at kind of volatilities correctly and what optimum inflation looks like. And each of these assumptions is easy to relax and you can use simulation and numerical methods to, to understand what happens. And this is really how modeling and trading works. So given that proof of stake is literally a financial asset, you probably want to model it the same way. All right, so like I said, the goal is to remove all sources of variance other than things related to rebalancing because this rebalancing is this bank run behavior that we care about. Okay, so the proof of stake assumptions, 
fixed number of agents, synchronous communication. So we assume perfect synchrony, not no partial synchrony, because we, the the variance obviously scales as you know basically the partial synchrony parameter squared. Um, money supplies deterministic, no transaction fees, no instant compounding. So you have to compound only at the end of an epoch. So that's sort of your model of locking, but it's a simple model of locking versus say Tezos or Cosmos. Single validator per block because there's there's some variance from committee selection uh, and no explicit unbonding periods. Um, basically the autocorrelation there is hard to prove things with. Uh, agents, the pseudonymous uh, identities are known by all validators. Agents can't choose the order of their transaction. We assume sort of there's this integer valued martingale that chooses the ordering so that they can't really do this. Uh, they draw their preference from a static random matrix ensemble. Why static? So that was one of the reviewers questions. Um, basically, if there is an equilibrium, there will be a static distribution because this process of the risk, you know, if I think of a random matrix system, if there is no stationary distribution and there's no circle law, then this thing is not stationary. So if we if we are assuming that there is an equilibrium at all, we actually have to have some static static long time distribution. And the next thing is agents kind of draw their risk based on expected times, expected time of being bonded and expected loan time. And the final thing is we have a parameter delta that controls the percentage of altruistic value. Finally, for lending. Agents don't inter interact with external lending markets. Uh, we assume for the formal proofs that there's just constant fraction of the money supply that's demand. And we, we kind of vary that parameter and then show a phase transition. And with simulation, we actually at least sample demand distributions, different demand paths. And basically flows in and out of the lending contract to, from staking are the only thing. So that basically says there's no external, no derivatives. Okay, formal results. So, uh, you know, I'm. Kind of going to brush over these, but you know, if you like probability theory, if you want to read about how like these sort of sub, semi, and super martingale inequalities work, they're in the paper, which is on archive. But the three main results: lending supply volatility uniformly bounds staking outflows. So basically, the volatility in the lent supply completely controls the outflow, which is you know, what you want, but showing that's the second moment is important because then you can start using other results. Uh, the next thing is that these, there's sort of this like monotonic phase transition where basically if the borrowing demand is too low, then you, you end up in a uh, state where everyone's always staked. If the borrowing demand's too high, you end up in a state where everyone's always lent. And if the borrowing demand is in the middle, you kind of end up in this oscillatory regime where people move between staked and lent. Um, and then the second thing is deflationary monetary policies are actually really bad. Okay, very high level. Here are all the variables involved. Uh, basically, there's the uh, the difference functions, which are these deltas. Uh, there's the actual supply and, and, and stake distributions, and then there are these kind of time constants, and then finally the lending rate, and then the altruistic state. Uh, so yeah, so. Lending supply uniformly bounds stake outflows. Basically, this just says that the, the, the sort of martingale difference type of thing is bounded by the square of the other one's difference function. The phase transition is quite is quite interesting. So basically, we show that uh, when there's two values, r plus and minus, and when the interest rate is strictly below r minus or strictly above r plus for all time, uh, then we end up in this kind of we have the super martingale phase transition. And so everyone, everyone's in this super martingale regime where the supply is fully lent or staked. In the middle, you actually end up right at R plus and minus. Uh, this thing is a martingale, so it's on average constant. Like whatever your starting stake distribution and lent distribution are, you should expect that for infinite time. And then in between, you get this oscillatory thing where you basically can bound the percentage staked and lent away from uh, 0 and 1. And finally, deflationary policies basically force you to rebalance often. So basically, if you're deflationary, you can show that you have rebalances that are larger than the altruistic stake, whereas if you're polynomial or inflationary in terms of your uh, money supply growth, that's less true. Uh, so kind of, we'll kind of quickly go through this, but basically in terms of uh, simulation, we assume this sort of constant demand fraction. So the demand this K times the money supply, where K is fixed. And the money supply, of course, is growing based on inflation. Uh, and basically, a more realistic model 
which we use, we simulate is uses non-trivial demand distributions, which reflect more realistically the free and locked token supply. There's explicit slashing. There's different parameters we can sweep through, and you know, basically we have a discretized inflation curve, uh, which matches more like Bitcoin's halving versus like interpolating a geometric curve through that. Cool. And so, in terms of demand distributions. Uh, you can basically see that we chose a bunch of different demand distributions. We did these kind of, uh, if you're familiar with stochastic processes, these kind of Brownian motions with reflecting boundary conditions. So score hard processes is score hard embedding type of stuff. And uh, you know, you can see that we we allow the token demand to go over the uh, total supply, which refers to kind of these uh, high leverage situations. So someone wants to go leverage long, like the demand should be way higher. So we, we try to model, make sure we, we encompass that. And here you can see that the different uh, sort of demand uh, behavior controls as you kind of change, uh, change the inflation rate, you can see that you go from these kind of like totally staked to totally lent scenarios. So in the upper right hand corner, you can see that you're when, basically when it's yellow, uh, we're measuring this kind of uh, stake supply to lend supply ratio, which is this ST minus LT over ST plus LT. Uh, you can basically see that it's dominantly staked. And then you can see at like lower uh, inflation, you can see that it's kind of on par or more lent in some cases. And obviously this all depends on the demand function. So you, you know, in reality, you need to adjust to that. Fi the final thing is looking at the phase transition where you can basically see what happens in this, it, it's a visually stark version of the super martingale to sub martingale phase transition. Um, but you can, you can, as you can see, you get this kind of weird oscillatory behavior. So conclusions, uh, the monetary policy of proof of stake networks just has to account for on-chain lending. This is basically impossible to stop because the censorship resistant nature of smart contracts means that there's not really a way of stopping this uh, in a truly decentralized network. Um, you know, we can formally demonstrate this and look at it by simulation. And in some sense, this shows that proof of stake networks are way more sim similar to central banks than they are to proof of work networks because they have to adjust their monetary policy based on real lending activity, which is exactly what a central bank does. In some sense, the, the world of repurchase agreements, maybe this is a little finance wonky, but it, it is, is, is not so different than this, uh, rebalancing staked and lent portfolios. And there's a lot of papers on how that was important in the financial crisis. So it's kind of interesting to see the same things pop up again. And these deflationary monetary policies kind of like Bitcoin seem much more detrimental to the proof of stake system. Um, but obviously we, we don't know what a fee market, a real fee market looks like uh, in proof of work. So stay tuned for the next 50 to hundred years, I guess. Uh, and finally, uh, future work is really focused on, you know, improving simulation to reflect real network behavior, adding in models of transaction fees, especially if there are bursts in transaction fees due to the increase in uh, shorting demand, and adding in additional forms of leverage. Uh, you know, these flash loan attacks are kind of a great example of, of, of a way someone could do this. If someone was lending the underlying stake token, now you can borrow a large portion of the stake supply. Uh, and the question is, can you actually make these uh, monetary policies resilient to that? And the final thing is sharding, because sharding actually does kind of change the suspect. Even in the polka dot style model of auctions, the auction price needs to reflect the best unbiased estimate of the maximum arbitrage that can happen. So that's it. Thanks very much, Tarun. So we have a little bit of time for questions. So please, if anybody's got some questions, please come down. Uh, please come down to the microphones here. I have a question for you, Tarun. Um, this is uh, on behalf of uh, Cyril Grunspan, who was one of the reviewers of the paper on our program committee. Um, and uh, he, this is a question that's beyond my pay grade, so I'm not sure if you've addressed this or not. Um, the author uses the compound model for the lending rate beta underscore t and gamma underscore t. This model involves constant parameters beta underscore zero, beta underscore one, gamma underscore zero. How should we choose these parameters? Is it possible to calibrate them? Can we add a stochastic factor to the interest model? What would happen then? What could be the conclusion of this study in that case? Yeah, it's, it's definitely a good question. So um, I guess on this, the fifth to last slide where I showed these um, heat maps, that's actually sweeping over those beta parameters. 
So it does assume they're they're quenched so that they're they're uh, not not changing over time. Uh, making them stochastic actually sort of corresponds to an implicit leverage ratio. So that would mean adding, you know, a replicating portfolio of the, the, the bonding curve adjusting would be equivalent to having a staked asset plus the staking derivative plus the underlying. And so that is definitely a thing to further study because uh, in practice, people are trying to add these stake derivatives and things like that. Great. Thanks to, also to Cyril for not making me look stupid. So um, we'll have a few questions from the floor. We'll start with Michael. You're modeling the central bank-like um, sort of optimization problem, and I'm wondering if you have any intuition or experience on the interaction effects between those sort of automation models. Because unlike the you know, raw central bank version of the problem where it's functionally discretionary policy to sort of control against these signals, you have highly observable signals and sort of a sort of multiplayer sort of automation game going on. And, and my curiosity is really the conditions under which the movement towards observation and automation might result in sort of dynamics other than the ones that we observe in the current systems that are intermediated by these discretionary roles. Um, I'm not totally sure I, 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 I understood. Uh I, I think question. I wasn't on for the first half, so this this might be a what in an IRL conference. This could be a coffee uh, side yeah. discussion. I'll, I'll pull it down. <laughs> Basically, what I'm asking is because the system is sort of observable signals, and both of the players, the sort of central bank-like role of the algorithms and the sort of portfolio optimizers, are effectively automatable, the question whether closing that loop might cause some things that are significantly different from what we observe in the central bank version of this type of problem, where there's always a discretionary like decision policy in between, where the, the sort of feedback from the automating on both sides. Oh, the, I see. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, one way this would probably change is, is you know, in, in the case of Compound, for instance, they're going to have, they announce their governance token. Uh, lenders could actually vote on changing the bonding curve. So this kind of thing of adjusting this, these parameters or having them stochastically vary, or you have a replicating portfolio of the derivative, that can actually happen by governance. Um, the question of whether that will happen is, is unclear, uh, but it's definitely not. It's definitely in the realm of possibilities. Um, so I, there is still a discretionary thing. The question is whether the the people can react as quickly <laughs> as, as needed. Fair enough. Uh, OK, uh, next question is Dan. Um, hi, Jeroen. Um, hey. I'm, uh, so am I right that your mo in your model, the lending demand is independent of the staking yield? I'm sorry, yes. I'm sorry, the borrowing demand, the borrowing demand. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so that's a very good point. Uh, basically, we use the diagonal uh, covariance matrix more because the uh, Realistically, it was because I wanted to get a tail inequality, and the moment you add in the correlation term, you're not. It's going to be a really ugly uh, tail inequality. But well, I have simulated it with perturbations away from that to the point that they are correlated. And you are right; there is there is some mollifying uh, effect. Uh, but I would say that the probably the correct way of controlling that mollifying effect from the perspective of a staking protocol designer is to really add a staking derivative uh, and make that the primary lending market. Well, but, but I, I think it would be, I mean, I think if you included this, wouldn't it actually make the situation even worse? Because uh, basically the main reason I could imagine someone wanting to borrow ETH in a staking regime would be in order to stake it, right? So if staking yields are higher, you'd actually expect borrowing demand to increase. Yeah. Uh, so basically, basically what you're talking about there is like, off diagonal terms and the covariance matrix being positive, uh, which would sort of like increase this. I did not, I, on the formal side, I don't know if that pushes the boundary in like asymptotically or whether the, the kind of point at which it's a martingale is, is not that, but that's an interesting question of whether you like shrink the phase transition regime uh, such that it's much worse. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Okay, so maybe some uh, avenues for future work. And uh, Rick, please. Yeah, I, hi. Um, I have two comments. Um, very simple one first. 
Um, what, what would happen if the uh, issuance rate was, uh, if the supply was truly fixed? I mean, you talked about inflation and deflation, but I didn't see in your charts what happens when it's fixed. Uh, yeah. So fixed is sort of the deflationary model. So when I say deflationary, I mean uh, like a Bitcoin like supply cap. So like constant minus some number less than one to the T. So like something that's decaying to that constant value. Uh, fixed for all time probably corresponds to that, but that's a good point. Uh, I didn't just assume kind of like a Ripple or Stellar style money supply where it just starts at X and it stays X forever. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it actually probably doesn't, especially if one of the problems with real world networks is that you, well, currently you lose tokens, right? They get, they, people lose their keys or whatever. And so that's a deflationary pressure. Whereas if you actually reclaimed those keys is really, or reclaimed that value so that there really was a constant supply of value available. I think, I mean, that's something that I'm working on. So I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts on that would be. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I don't know. I suspect you would have the same issue as you would in the purely deflationary land. Uh, but I did not analyze it formally, so I'm not quite sure. I would have to do a little more. Yeah. Digging. But I, I see where you're coming from there, and it makes sense uh, to to model that in a certain way. Yeah, just something to think about. And then my um, other point, which is more of a comment, is that uh, for me as a designer. I actually, I kind of want these bank runs to happen, right? Because I actually want my community to be uh, incentivized based on the not purely financial utility of the network, but by the transactions that we facilitate, right? So if I could quickly just sort of weed out all the like, you know, parasitic investors, that's that's fine, right? Because I just want the people that actually want to transact to use the network. Yeah, I, it's just hard to do that if you have a, a really censorship resistant smart contract. Uh, I, I like eventually someone is going to see some type of profit from like reallocating the stake tokens. Uh, and I'm not totally sure if there's really a way of getting around that in, in in, in this world, Un unless you don't have smart contracts. Like you could imagine something where you you make like the lockups and, and stuff for the stake tokens in, in such a way that there's just absolutely no lending, but then people probably won't use it. If you look at uh, cryptocurrency lending right now, one of the craziest things that I still don't understand is that BlockFi is lending GUSD for 19% right now, right? Like people, the lending demand right now is unreal. And, and it's clear that people will do it off chain, even if you don't support it. So I'm, it's just like a little hard to uh, quite imagine everything. Yep. Thank you. All right. In the interest of time, we'll wrap up. Thanks very much, Tarun. Let's give him a round of applause. Yeah. Thanks.